Good morning. Whether you're a longtime attendee or here as a guest, welcome to this historic house of devotion. As we come together for worship and partnership, we are delighted to have each of you here with us. Gathering is a part of community of faith. Let us reflect upon this magnificent autumn day. Let the change of the seasons with the artistry of this earthly beauty be just one sign of God's unlimited creativity that we are happy to share together in this time and place. Let us nurture this awe-inspiring earth as God's earth has nurtured us now and in the days to come. Friends, let us rejoice in this day. So this is uh, sort of the end of our formal time following the Worship Design Studio series that we've been using uh, over the past several weeks, written by um, a good Methodist. And so I say that for our Methodist guests, just to make sure you all know, we're using a Methodist worship series, so you came at the right time. And uh, Dr. McPhee, who teaches liturgy and worship to all kinds of folks, uh, reminds us about what we've been working on for the past several weeks. How do we do on to one another? How do we love one another? And those practices of kindness and compassion and patience and all those things come together today with love. And she writes this, she says, loving our neighbors, including relatives, coworkers, acquaintances, strangers, as ourselves is no simple task. We need God. We need the love of God to show us mercy and strength to love as God loves. We need the story of Jesus, the one who loved across the lines that had been drawn in the society of his day, but who also stood up for the least and the lost. We need faith that no matter the strain of differing positions, policies, and politics, we will move forward in love. Disagreeing need not be antithetical to love and grace, and indeed our word dep world depends on all of us working for a better world, filled with more kindness, compassion, humility, respect, and love. Let us join together in singing our theme song. Opening prayer, the act of simply coming together is revolutionary, which in its earliest form meant finding a course around a central point. We gather around the light of Christ as the center and the guiding light of our lives. This becomes our point of reference for our relationships and our love in the world. This is our love revolution. Let us pray in unison. Loving God, I am asking you to stay close to our lives as we head into our future. Wrap us in your love and invite us to go and likewise to unto others in ways that build up your kingdom. 
on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in his name of Jesus, the center that holds, and the power of the Spirit that transforms. Amen. Yes. Breathe. Let us imagine this kind of outcome. Breathe again. We are not alone. Christ is with us. Let us take a deep breath together. But the rhythm of our breath and the heartbeat, the rhythm of our breath and heartbeat is the same. Our desire for life and love is the same. Our desire for peace in which we flourish is the same. Let this moment permeate our souls and let us pass the peace of Christ between us. The peace is meant for all people. The peace of Christ be with you. And also
Good morning. So for the last month or so, we've been delving into the theme of our stewardship campaign, Do Unto Others, by showing how the values of kindness, compassion, humility, and respect are so evident and are such an important part of our lives and our ministry here at UCF. Today I'm wrapping it all up with a nice bow. And um, our final value is love. To me, love is the heart of everything we do. I want you to think back, and for me it's like way back in time about when you went to Sunday school. And what was the first lesson that you learned? What were you taught? when you were very young. For me, and probably for most of you, it was that Jesus loves us. And now we're taking that love and we're spreading it through our church community and our larger Syracuse com uh, community and far across our country and the world. So already this morning I've seen the love that we share here at United Church with the um, sharing of the joys and concerns of our congregation and passing the peace and John's um, prelude with the, you know, the title, Here is Love. So here is love right in this sanctuary. And just an aside, a couple um, was it two weeks ago when we had um, Church in the World's yep. Service Sunday? A friend of mine came. I invited her to go. I was going to do the um, uh, food pantry clean out. And I asked her if she wanted to come, and she said, sure. And I said, well, you could, you know, meet me at church. You can come to church. And she said, oh, I would love to come to your church. I mean, we've been friends forever, but... Um, she's just never, she's never been here. Uh, she grew up a kind of a strict Catholic and um, really has kind of fallen away from that part, but she is the kindest, most loving person. So I, you know, told her how to get here and I would be downstairs if she wanted to come down, you know, for choir rehearsal. And um, she said, I'll just meet you in the sanctuary. So by the time I got up here, you know, and met her, um, she was already seated. She goes, oh my gosh, I have met almost everyone in this church. I was greeted, I feel so loved. And then we went on to the passing of the peace and we sat back down, she goes, is it always like this? I said, mm -hmm, it is. And she said, I could write an essay about this. Cindy knows who I'm talking about because she worked with us at Mott Road. Um, but she was so impressed by the love that she experienced in the first five minutes that she was here. So that's, you know, I attribute that to all of you because I wasn't here. <laughs> I was downstairs. So um, to me, as you probably know, music is a huge part of my life here. And it's a way to feel and express love. And it could be through um, our interpretations during signing. It could be during a handbell piece where, like today's anthem, um, a lot of songs have got a, a meaning, a, a past to them, and a storyline. And when all those bells come together, and the crescendo, it gives me what I call a goosebumps moment. So and we've done so many beautiful choir anthems um, also, and the words bring us right back to our theme of, uh, you know, love one another and do unto others. Uh, today our anthem is called I Believe, and it focuses a lot on love and believing in it, which I know we all believe here because we see it all the time. 
Um, in the bulletin, you'll see that John wrote a little note um, that will give you the background of this story. So if you read that, you'll really get more meaning out of the words of this, of this um, anthem. And a little spoiler alert, I wanted to tell you a little bit of, about it. And here I am, podium, microphone, and I cannot, and a song, and I can't help myself, but I have to teach you a few signs. <laughs> cannot help myself. So it starts out, I believe, and you hold on to that belief, that the sun, even I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. We start out with just a few voices. The rest of the women join in, and then it will move into I believe love in love, even when I don't feel it. And then the lower voices come in, and the crescendo, um, and the love is just swirling around, and it's a little chaotic and haunting, but it's amazing. And then it ends with a solo, I believe in God, even when God is silent. So I hope you all will feel that goosebump moment um, during our anthem, and really realize all we do and will continue to do to help others not only believe in our love for them, but to truly feel that love and then pass it out to others in the world. Amen. It is our time for continuing to hear the really good news of the gospel. We've heard from Barb some of the ways that's embodied in our life. And that's one of the ways we see our world, right? But we wear most of us bifocals, some of us trifocals, some of us contacts so you don't know we really have glasses on. But John Calvin famously said that we put on glasses, right, as disciples so that we see the world, see the world through the focus of scripture, through the focus of love. And so let's hear these words that Jesus said before he died, when he was busy, working so very, very hard to convince his brothers and sisters, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, there on the Temple Mount and the crowds that heard him, to convince them of the truth of God's love. Hear this story from Matthew's Gospel. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. A word of God for our time. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. The world is now too dangerous and too beautiful for anything but love. May your eyes be so blessed you see God in everyone. 
your ears so you hear the cry of the poor. May your hands be so blessed that everything you touch is a sacrament, God's love made visible. Your lips so you speak nothing but the truth with love. May your feet be so blessed you run to those who need you. May your heart be so open, so set on fire, that your love, your love, changes everything. And may the blessing of the God who created you, loves you, and sustains you be with you now and always. May it be so. Amen. So I just returned from visiting my dad in Pittsburgh. He's in his 90s, and he lives in a retirement community in Mount Lebanon, not far from where he was born, in Avella, which is a small coal mining town. Leaving my dad is always hard, because he takes after his mom. So he needs to make sure anyone who visits is ready to travel. Dave and I talked about how maybe this is a dad gene. You know, once you become a dad, this enters into your DNA. I don't know, but those of you who are dads, let's see. So you have to have a meal together before you get on the road, right? And you need to make sure that you take with you handmade sandwiches and snacks because you'll get hungry on the road, right? And then as you're walking out and almost in the car, no matter how old you are, dad's going to slip you some cash. So you don't rat out of money on the road. There you go. Now, what you need to know is my grandmother's version of this was really embarrassing because I had friends who would stop and visit her, you know, from seminary or as undergrads because Graham just welcomed everybody. And her practice was to make sure everyone had new underclothes. Imagine how awkward that is when you hear from your friends, you know, my ma, your grandma, she asked my bra size. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. And then you had to have a bag of food for the road, and she got up at four in the morning before you left to hand make the meatballs for the pasta so that you had a full stomach before driving wherever you were driving. In Alaska, where I served as a volunteer in mission with some good Methodists and Presbyterians, I might add, this practice was really similar in the community potlucks that happened among the Inuit. A person who'd been blessed with an unexpected gift or was celebrating a birthday or a wedding invited folks to come in. And everybody would share food, mostly side dishes, because the person giving the celebration provided the main meal, and they gave everyone a gift out of their blessings. It was a wonderful way to share bounty, because the folks in Native communities in many parts of the world, not just in Alaska, are subsistence folks, right? They catch or grow what they need. There's not usually a lot of extra, and whatever they get, especially if there's more, they share with the community. And I think about my gram growing up in the Depression, and my dad still talking about her amazing ability to share food with all the kids in the neighborhood if they were hungry, because she had this great garden. And so if one or two or the entire football team came over. She just added some more vegetables to whatever she was making, and there was enough for everyone. Dad, when he took that same upbringing and skills to his work in banking, no less, right? Who knew, right? As a manager, um, he would go into departments that weren't working super well and figure out a way together with the department, whatever that group of people were, to make them more productive. Now, you know, that usually means that somebody's going to have to find another job, right? That often means that things will change. And what I would always hear from folks that worked with my dad was, you know what, they might not be working at the same bank, but even after all the rearranging and all the change, 
my dad would always make sure they landed on their feet with another job in another place. It was pretty impressive for me. That was some of my experience of love. Not perfect, not complete, very human. And as I continue my journey of baptism, just as you continue yours, I deepened my understanding of those promises that my parents made when I was a baby. My parents and my godparents in the Episcopal Church, I am an ecumenical mess, you all knew that, right? <laughs> Promised to obey the commandments and keep God's will on my behalf. And after lots of study and reading and taking responsibility for myself, right, and lots and lots of service, this is the scripture I would always return to. Love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And by now you've probably figured this out, I keep trying to love my neighbor so that I can love God, right? But I still fall short, not only in height. So on, so I knew somebody would get it. Y'all are a little sleepy today. <clears throat> on the drive to my dad's, I listened to Bishop Michael Curry's podcast, calling the Episcopal Church to the way of love. Not that they hadn't been doing it before, but he wanted to make sure they were clear. To a rule of life, an ancient monastic practice that isn't so much about setting rules to be obeyed as reminding you what's really important so you could keep coming back like a touchstone, because it's easy these days to get off track. To a rule of love, a rule of life that focused on love. And for those who don't know Bishop Curry, you've heard him, many. He served as the presiding American bishop for the last few years and most famously preached a sermon on love at this tiny little wedding in England between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Nobody was there um, or paid much attention to it, but he was the guy. And here's part of what he said. He said, think and imagine a world where love is the way. Imagine our homes and families where love is the way. Imagine neighborhoods and communities where love is the way. Imagine governments and nations where love is the way. Imagine business and commerce where love is the way. Imagine this tired old world where love is the way, when love is the way, unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive. When love is the way, then no child will go to bed hungry in this world ever again. When love is the way, we will let justice roll down like a mighty stream and righteousness like an ever-flowing brook. When love is the way, poverty will become history when love is the way the earth will be a sanctuary when love is the way we will lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside to study war no more when love is the way there's plenty good room for all of god's children because when love is the way we actually treat each other well you know like we're family when love is the way, we know that God is the source of us all, and we are brothers and sisters, children of God. He concludes, my brothers and sisters, that's a new heaven, a new earth, a new world, a new human family, no matter what is going on. Now, the important thing to know here is that the way of love isn't just for Episcopalians. It's not just for young couples that happen to get married in Windsor Castle. It's not just for dads or grandmas, although dads and grandmas have a pretty good lock on that, or the Inuit of Alaska. Nope. The way of love is for all of us. Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Christian, non-Christian, non-believers. The way of love is for all of us. It's a rule of life. It's a touchstone. It's something we can come back to. D 
deep in our souls to remind us who created us, love. Why are we here? To love. What are we called to do? To love our neighbors. In a world full of isolation and inequality, a world full of disasters, grief, and conflict, love's a way worth choosing, isn't it? Love is indeed worth our investment of time and talent and resources, isn't it? May we love God with all our heart, all our minds, all our souls, and all our strength. May we love our neighbors as ourselves. May we love as Christ loves us. May we love even when, like our brothers and sisters, in the hell of concentration camps, even when they didn't feel love at all, still believed. Alleluia. Amen. Please be seated. It is our time to raise our prayers to God, both in silence and in spoken word, each of us, beloved, each of us offering a different way, a different story of looking at our world. We come to prayer today as those whom God loves deeply despite our flaws and sometimes failed attempts at loving others. We come knowing that without the capacity to love, we are without capacity to hope. We are without capacity to survive in this world. Our frailty requires heroic acts of connection that we sometimes believe are beyond our ability to achieve and perhaps it is beyond us, but not beyond God. And so we pray together the prayers of the people, the prayers of those beloved, for we're all in need of help. We pray for your guidance for ourselves and others. We pray for the ability to hope against hopelessness for ourselves and others. We pray for the spiritual capacity for love for ourselves and others. We pray for mercy when we fail for ourselves and others. Holy and loving God, we lift our prayers for a world that has trouble believing and trusting in love. We pray for a world that feels some days as if all we do is yell and fight. We pray for our world that you have given us. We pray that the way we give thanks to you for all that you have given us is to choose love in spite of evidence that it might not work. To choose love in spite of evidence that it might not make us enough money. To choose love in spite of evidence that says sometimes 
it won't produce change. To choose love, knowing that you chose love. You chose love in the greatest gift of your son, Jesus Christ, to each one of us, and you choose love each and every day through the gift of your spirit to each of us gathered here. And so we pray for places far away, where people are struggling with disaster and war. We pray for those leading. We pray for those offering relief and support. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for our nation as we seek to discern your will in the coming days to discern a leader for us who will lead with love and compassion. We pray in elections, big and small, that we will select leaders with wisdom, leaders who have chosen to love. We pray that you will guide us as a nation, that we might find ways to love one another. We pray for guidance in our churches and our communities that we might truly choose the way of love and shout it from the rooftops not so much with words, maybe, but through service, through food, through housing, through those concrete, tangible things that we do with all our gifts and talents that can make such a difference. We pray that you will grant us the melody that will raise the hairs on the back of our heads, Give us all goosebumps because no matter what, no matter how scared we feel, we can take a chance and choose to trust and believe in the love you have given us through God. Let us join together in the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us bring our gifts to God.
gracious and loving God, we ask that you would take these gifts of our time, of our talents, and of our resources, use them as you use us, that we might show the way of love to a world longing for connection, longing for your message. Amen. So it's our time to talk a little bit about mission and ministry. You heard an announcement at the beginning asking for folks to help with some cooking for the Steeple Coffee House, and there are signups right outside in the front. You also heard an announcement that we have a blood drive on Saturday from 8 to 1. Please, if you can offer to participate in that, sign up. You'll see information about the food pantry right outside the door. And our beloved friend is here, and I bet you she'd be happy, right, Pam, to chat with you about what's going on if you have any questions. Um, so there are a few handouts at the front as well, and I just want to draw your attention to them. Information about how to help with hurricane relief is there. You've got uh, information from the Baptists and the Presbyterians. We don't have the Methodist stuff, but we all do one great hour of sharing. So it's all going through um, the same mechanism to our friends. The United Church of Christ uh, published a 40 days of prayer uh, for the nation. And as we go to the polls, if you would find this helpful, there are copies of that. And even more fun would be the activity pack from the Heifer Project for your children or grandchildren for October. Finally, we do have uh, a sacred conversation in the Beard Lounge following uh, worship, but please go get some food and sustenance because otherwise you won't be able to talk. So you have to have some food. That's what my dad says. You have to have some food. You probably need coffee at this stage, maybe more than you thought. Make sure you save a little for Bob, though, because by the time he gets there, sometimes it's kind of it's low. So save a little coffee for Bob. Um, but, um, but take some and come join us in Beard Lounge and we can talk about um, the next faithful steps that God is calling us to do. Is there anything I forgot? Looks like we're okay. In that case, we're going to continue by sort of rippling on out into the world. Love that image. You know, it's so fun and so accessible. How many of your grandchildren have challenged you to the stone skipping ripple challenge. <laughs> Happens to me all the time. You know, I'll go down to the pond and once the ducks who have fed well after we've been there um, move out of the way, because really skipping stones over ducks is awkward. Um, we have to see how many skips we can get and how big the ripples are. I hope that as we sing our final song, you're thrown back to those youth group days, uh, which I think works for many of us in this age, I'm thinking. Um, your youth group days where this was a pretty common song for all of us who gathered at youth group and was actually written by a priest in Chicago during the Civil Rights Movement who was looking for an ecumenical song that students could sing during the marches. And so this is what he came up with. Let's join together.
And so as John gathers the candle to bring it out of the sanctuary, hear these words of blessing. May the Holy One show you the way to do unto others with love. May the Christ, whose light is the center of all that is, ground you in the assurance that no one is outside of love. May the Spirit show forth through you in extraordinary acts you never imagined you had the power to achieve. And may you know the peace that surpasses all understanding, especially when it's difficult to understand. And the people said, Amen. Amen.